Okay, good afternoon. I am Staff Sergeant Kekawa with the Sacramento Medical Recruiting Station. And joining me is Captain uh, Sage Buzini. He is our station officer in charge or OIC. Sarkay, I believe you're muted right now. Bear with us here. Sometimes the uh, government computers get a little finicky when trying to use Zoom and a presentation at the same time. <laughs> Being on Zoom and talking can just be too much. Okay, what about now? Yep. Can hear you now. Awesome. Okay, let's try this again. Maybe. Just trying to enlarge the presentation. Is that good? Looks good. Awesome. Wait, I am Staff Sergeant Kikawa with the Sacramento Medical Recruiting Station. And joining me is Captain Sage Buzini, our station officer in charge, or OIC. A bit about myself, I've served uh, almost 20 years in March. And I have done medical logistics, medical supplies for most of that time. Past three years, I've been here at the office and I've done Deployments have been everywhere, basically around the world, as far as assignments and deployments. Um, but right now, we're here to talk to you about the Health Profession Scholarship Program. And if some of you are familiar with it or not, because you're here, uh, then we'll go over the details of what it entails. This is our agenda. And what is the Health Profession Scholarship Program? Uh, basically, it is a fully funded scholarship for those students interested in either the medical, dental, veterinary, clinical psychology, um, exactly what's there on the screen. Uh, the Health Profession Scholarship covers basically the same things, however, the differences would be uh, what the requirements are for each specific um, type of medicine you're going into. So what the program facts include are, like I said, 100% tuition, right? Fully funded, you don't have to pay anything, um, covers also materials, fees at your school of choice, whether that be a medical school or a, a DO school. You also have a sign-on bonus, which you're, you're eligible to accept um, or decline. It's $20,000. Um, and you have a monthly stipend. Now, a lot of applicants or those looking into this scholarship, one of the first questions I get from them is basic training. Do I have to go to basic training, right? I think a lot of people have a concept of Oh, I don't want to go through mud or climb big obstacles or swing from things or jump out of planes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that probably comes from watching a lot of TV, uh, maybe YouTube or even movies. But as an officer, that is not what you'll be doing. And what you will be doing, I will cover that further on in the slide. These are the requirements to apply. Must be a, a US citizen. Have an acceptance letter or currently applying to a medical program. 
And then the minimum um, criteria as far as your MCAT scores and your GPA are provided right there. Keep that in mind because I have additional information towards the end of the presentation. All right, so what are the incentives um, for you during medical school, right? They said the monthly stipend. You'll be paid that little over $2,700 a month. Again, fully funded scholarship, covers books and materials. And the takeaway is this sign-on bonus, right? There is a caveat to that meaning you would have to owe additional um, time, but we'll cover that later on. And so in pay and allowances, you're looking at just over $100,000 a year with this scholarship. So moving on to residency, you would get promoted to captain, have a housing allowance and a food allowance, which is your basic allowance for a subsistence. And then special pay, just depending on your type of schooling that you're going to. Okay. Average civilian resident salary is gonna be on the high side, 60,000 per year, compared to over 117,000 a year while you're going through residency school. So the match process. Um, there's a national match process and then there's our process. And our process is comparable, meaning that it's a computer match, right? And our results are released in mid-December with a 96 to 98% first choice uh, match rate. The most competitive is emergency medicine, those that are listed right there. Um, and then the first choice assignment, 70% of residents get that first choice assignment. And just to quickly clarify with this too, so there will be different opportunities for you guys to conduct a residency. Like you could do your emergency medicine rotation for your, for your residency in California or Colorado, and there's different locations for that residency. And so that's to say that 96 to 98% of people are going to get their first choice of residency, and then 70% of people are gonna get their first choice of location to do that residency at. And these are some of the residency options. You're welcome to take a snapshot or a picture of this, whatever. Okay, and this slide right here, while you're in and, you know, once you've completed your, your, um, education, residency, your actual practicing position, surgeon, et cetera, um, you'll have the opportunity to continually train on the latest developments, techniques. Um, you'll also be able to attend uh, specialty conferences and even do fellowship programs. Um, and you'll also be able to do or instruct uh, Courses. Some of the courses are on the right hand side of the page and have the ability to do research. So in my experience, um, I've had the combat casualty care course, even though I am not a um, doctor, I am not a medic, because I'm in the medical field, the career field. I have the opportunity to do that course. Um, and that is one of the courses that you could instruct. All 
Okay, so what are your expectations during the school year? You have to maintain a full-time student status, right? The Army is paying for your education and wants you to be successful in order to graduate with your degree. Um, part of that also, also includes you attending the direct commission course, basic officer leader course, and then doing hospital rotations. The direct commission course is I guess it would be, you could consider it your basic training, although it's more in class, right? You're learning about uh, the military, you're learning about being a military officer, army officer, um, and that you also have opportunities to do um, team building, um, I won't say competitions, but team building events. The basic officer leader course is at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And while you're there, you're learning about the Army um, health system, along with you know, mapping out your career specific to your uh, area of concentration um, and how you could be successful. And then, as it says, doing your hospital rotations at a military treatment facility. Can I jump in here real quick, sir? Okay. Please, sir. Um, yeah, so I personally went to Bullock at Basic Officer Leader Course in San Antonio. It's a blast. I had a ton of fun. You were staying in a hotel the whole time. And like Sergeant K said, you are learning about the basics of Army medicine while you're going through. So it's a classroom environment. You're going to school kind of from, you know, nine to five and you get the rest of your day off. You can travel, you get the weekends off. It's, we, we call it a gentleman's course really. So it's, it's like I said, it's a lot of fun. I made some of my really close friends there who I stay in contact to this day. And so it's split up into two parts. So the first part is more of an introductory like didactic portion where you're learning, you know, again, about these basics of army medicine, how it, the history of it, how it operates. And then the second part of it, you're gonna split up with other, service members who are who share your same specialty so physicians would split up and then you go and you do a rotation at a hospital there and you learn about you know the military electronic health record systems and things that you would utilize while you are a pr practicing physician and so it's cool it's a really great way to you know get some hands-on learning about the job that you will about you are about to take afterwards thank you sir Okay, so what are the benefits that active duty service members have? 100% medical and dental and vision coverage, uh, 30 days annual paid vacation, no cost moves and relocation without loss of seniority. All right, so what are the no cost moves? So when you're done with your um, residency, you're gonna receive an assignment. And more than likely, it's not gonna be in the same location that your schooling is at, right? So you'll be off, let's say you're doing your schooling here in California and they send you across to Germany. That entire move is not, is paid by um, the government. So the loss of seniority, right? Relocating, you can kind of think of it as a sort of a, a lateral promotion, right? You don't lose your seniority. You don't have to start at the bottom once you move. Um, and what the Army tries to do is put you into a position where you are preparing, learning, getting the experience uh, for when you uh, t attain and achieve your next rank. So it's like a, a preparation, right? Um, so for, I'll say for, although I'm not an officer, I'll use myself as an example. I left my last assignment as a, we'll say a manager of a platoon, about 40 people in it, 35 to 40 people in it. Um, and when I took this position, I didn't lose anything as far as my rank or, um, or how can I word this? or experience. Uh, what I did was, this is an additional duty assignment. I learned how to give back 
to the army being a recruiter. The other option is being a drill sergeant. And there's a few others, but this is the route that I took. Um, and so though I'm not doing my work as a medical logistics sergeant, I'm helping the army. I'm learning how to be a recruiter. Um, I'm learning the other side of the army. And there's opportunities for you as you progress in your career to do different things to not only help the army, but again, to um, progress in your career uh, and also additional education. Yeah, and just to touch on that too. So in your guys's instance, in your guys's situation, if you're applying to become a physician, right? You'll go and serve in a hospital in one instance in one position, right? And to just highlight what Staff Sergeant Kakawa was saying about lo not losing seniority is that oftentimes if you were to move from a civilian hospital and you hold a position and you've held it for several years and you go on to the next hospital, you can lose seniority in the sense that you don't have the same amount of experience working in this new system. And so by taking on another position in a different system, you are still going to be treated as someone who is tenured in that position. And so you're not losing seniority and you're not having to start from the bottom in that way. So it makes continuing your job a lot easier because you are treated as someone who has been in that position for as long as you technically have been. You know what I mean? So that's kind of how that relocation without loss of seniority works. And it plays to your guys' advantage really well when you go, when you guys are serving in a military capacity and you want to exit the military and become a, a doctor on the civilian side is because now you have held several different positions and you have a lot of, you have varied experience in your field. So that way you can be a more well-rounded physician and serving, serving in a civilian capacity and have more experience and hands-on experience than you might have if you weren't serving in a military hospital. And just to touch on the moves, because sometimes this is a question that we get brought up a lot, is how the move process works, how getting your first assignment works. So we have a preference system that you guys would utilize, right? So you don't just get sent anywhere that the Army wants to send you, right? Instead, you guys will get the opportunity to look in a system that we utilize to see what positions are available that you would fit to. So if you are emer an emergency medicine physician, you would say there is a position open in Fort Carson, Colorado, and there's a position there and you would apply for that position and you can rank them, right? So you can rank the different locations and positions from one to however many you want to rank. And you would get to match with those positions based off of an interview or something. It's kind of like applying for a normal job. So you get a heavy say in where you want to go. So if you want to go to Hawaii, cool. There's a position open there and you get to apply to go to that position. And then where that fits in with these no cost moves is that the army will pay for someone to come by to your place, they'll pack everything for you. They'll load it up. They'll deliver it to your next place. You've already found an apartment or a house or wherever you want to stay. They'll drop it off. They'll unload it and unpack it for you. And it's all at no cost to you. You actually usually walk away with a few thousand dollars in your pocket from that move for gas or whatever right they they compensate you pretty well so that's how that works and it makes it less stressful when you're going from one position to the next okay so the bottom line again is you're graduating with a degree and not a debt right but whatever loan you can see right here on this chart you're gonna be owing more than what you're gonna be making so this is one of the reasons why um, I fully encourage you to consider and apply for this scholarship. Okay, so when do you apply? You can start applying within six months of your undergraduate um, graduation. So fourth year of undergraduate school, through the first quarter of your first year of med school. And it's a monthly selection board. Uh, we have we go by the fiscal year calendar. So from one October to 30 September, basically every month we're having a selection board for this um, scholarship. All right, application tips. Uh, Remember at the beginning, I mentioned the minimum requirements, even highlighted here on the right-hand side. Uh, so 
On the left hand side, it says highly qualified acceptance criteria. This is something that's new, meaning this fiscal year. Um, if you have a 510 MCAT score, GPA of 3.7, um, are accepted into a medical school, et cetera, et cetera, that means you're automatically qualified for this scholarship. Uh, other things you can consider is how much leadership, managerial, supervisory type roles you've had. That can also help demonstrate uh, you know, the leadership qualities um, that you will be experiencing in, a, in your military career. Volunteer work, because the Army is a volunteer organization. Uh, that's something that is looked at. Now that can be either in your community. I highly suggest you do something within your field of interest. Um, and your statement of motivation, right? not how this scholarship can benefit you because those uh, making the selection for the scholarship, they already know what the advantages of the scholarship pertains. What they wanna know is what qualities, what skills you have that can benefit the army, but also set you apart from your peers. There is an interview process, um, so just, brush up on those skills, and then your research experience. I was just talking to, to a student earlier today, and she was concerned because she didn't have the research experience um, because when she was going through her undergraduate, she was in the middle of COVID. And so that opportunity was taken away from her. And just to say that, um, you know, if you don't have the scores, but you have the minimum requirements, don't be discouraged. Because I've seen, um, I've seen applicants get accepted with less than the the um, HQAC, the highly qualified acceptance criteria. So you have a chance. Don't um, don't shy away from the scholarship just based on what you see here. Right. And lastly, we do, well, we do um, Q&A sessions for the MedCore Health Profession Scholarship Program with uh, the health professions advising during their drop-ins. Our days are on Wednesdays from 12 to 2. The next three times are listed here. And this is the um, contact information if you're interested on one-on-one -on -one information. And my contact information is at the bottom and Captain Buzzini's is also. All right, thank you so much um, for giving our students such a great presentation. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to speak up now uh, just by unmuting or you can leave it in the Q&A. Um, if you have any questions for HPA, uh, I can answer those as well. I think we're gonna hang out for a couple minutes and see if there's any questions that need answering. I'm trying to find my way back to the room. It looks like a couple people dropped off, but uh, the question is where can I find the recorded video? Um, I am not sure who, unless the uh, HPA group will have the recorded video and then we'll be able to send it out to yeah. the student body. There. Yeah, I, I started the recording, so I should be getting that. Um, and then I'll send it over to you guys and Karen, and then uh, you guys, uh, you can get it from there. Right on. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, if you have any questions that, you know, you think of over the course of the next couple of days as you're mulling on this information and you take a look at the presentation or the 
recording, you know, like at the very end of that presentation, there was our contact information. If you have questions, we're always available to answer. Um, Staff Sergeant Krakow is very knowledgeable and will be able to help you out in any way, shape or form. Sure. Okay, then I think with that, we'll probably call it. I think that's it. Cool. Well, thank you for uh, dropping good. in. And uh, Tanish, thanks for stopping by and uh, being available for this. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. You guys take care. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.